Hi, everybody, and welcome to the European VC podcast. In the hot seat with me today, we have Kushal Shah from eant.com. I'm Andreas, and taking David's usual seat as my co-host, we've got Omar Hassan from Mina Tech Fund. Everyone, if you're listening in and love our show, do drop us a review, follow the pod, and remember to subscribe at eu.vc. Tear down this wall. It's more than just an alliance. An alliance. This, this is a union of values, of values. United and determined, we can serve as a model for other regions of the world. The nature of a problem, problem requires a European response. Europe is a story of new beginnings, new, new beginnings. Let's start acting, acting, acting. This show is not investment advice, and the hosts of this episode may be invested in the funds and companies featured. Welcome, everyone. Excited. Thank you. There's a lot of pressure stepping into David's seat, but um, hopefully I'll do some justice. Finally, I have a bald brother with me, which makes me all the more happy. (laughs) This is actually out of choice, by the way. I keep telling people this is out of choice. I could grow it. That's what you say. I said that in my 20s as well, so... (laughs) Exactly. Um, Okay, guys, we've got North Star coming up in October, and we're going for the first year, David and I, and we cannot wait to hear what we've got ahead of us. So, Omar, Kushal, you guys have been there for quite a few years, so I'd love to just ask you, what do we have to look forward to? So, so first of all, it's going to be in a different location than last time. So this will be make it interesting. I think it's going to be a more hipster area than, than the the more tra- traditional trade center type of area. So I, I think that's that's already a start uh, and, and expect chaos as, as part of it, uh, organized chaos. So I like <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> second, you, you'll get to get a feel for Dubai at its peak. Uh, you know, October, November is always a, a good buzzing moment for Dubai. Lots of things are happening. So when you come, there'll be activities all over the shop. I've been North Star for five years now, I think since the first one. So North Star was born about five years ago alongside Jitex. For anybody that comes, there's that initial shock uh, in terms of the size of it, in terms of that this is in the UAE. I think a lot of people don't understand. I mean, to put it into context, it's, I mean, it's a lot larger, but imagine walking to Mobile World Congress or CS for the first time. What can you expect over, I'll give you some numbers, over a thousand exhibitors? over 500 global funds, over 2,000 startups from over 70 countries, and a lot of people and a lot of fun. And Kush is right, it's moved to Dubai Harbour. It's more of a festival feel this year. Um, so there'll be plenty of sunshine away from the indoors of Dubai World Trade Center. Best thing about it, I think, it's the experience it firsthand that you're not just in Dubai. It's a global summit. Um, so you'll see a bit of Africa, a bit of Asia, a lot of Europe, America. Um, so for anybody coming for the first time, probably just get your walking trainers on and not shoes, um, and it'll be a lot of fun. Nice. Yeah, I, I think the energy levels will be will be very interesting. You, yeah. You'll get a very good vibe. If anyone, so to anyone listening in, if this sounds like something that you should be joining in for, then for sure hit me up because we're going and uh, and we are doing some stuff with Omar. So I'm pretty sure we can get your sweet gig going there. So for sure. Any UVC uh, uh, lover and friend, we would love to help get the best experience uh, in Dubai, Dubai in these uh, days. Am I right in saying it's mid-October? I'm shit with dates, Omar, so help me here. October the 15th is day one, which is a Sunday, um, and to October the 18th, with Sunday being the opening day and the GPLP Summit that Sunday evening at the Bulgari Hotel, and then a whole week long of an event. But Kushal, now let's dive into the hardiness of this show and get your story and how you got into venture. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, ventures has always been, I, I, I was brought up in an entrepreneurial family, so it's kind of in the DNA. So I, once I got into my first job in a corporate kind of setting, I was always looking to stick my neck out and see what can I adventure into. So out of that job, uh, there was a, a Muslim friend and a, and a Jewish friend that got together and said, hey, let's set up a little bagel shop. 
and I, and I thought, come on, guys, this is this is gonna be fun. So so Hindu me said, let's go, let's go. I'll go in with you. But we decided forget the bagel shop. Subways as a franchise was coming on, so we took on a Subway franchise. And over a period of seven years, one of them left his job. Over a period of seven years, we built 24 Subway restaurants in London. So yes. that was the first call it venture. It, there was no tech in it. Where was the first one, Kush? Where in London was it? Good Street. Good Street. Wow. Okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Cool. Next to the next to the schools, uh, there was a lot of uh, university traffic. <laughs> footfall. Yeah. When I learned about footfall and locations and 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 also the long versus broad versus you know designing it. Uh, so data data was a key part of our discussions of, um, of of where to invest and how to invest and how to close it down as well fast. Ah, yeah, uh, that, yeah, so that must have been important. That, that was the beginning. And then what got you to Dubai then? So at some point, uh, one of my colleagues uh, won a project to, to create a telecom operator in Dubai. And that time there was only a monopoly player. So I basically moved over to support uh, the launch of a, of a telecom operator. So that's, that's why I came here. And then I, in my old job, we used to launch telecom operators all over the world in, in emerging markets. So in some ways, that was a venture as well, because it's not our money. But in, in six to nine months, you have to go live. And, and the pressure is on. It's a countdown. You literally have a clock on the wall that says 48 days to go, 47 days to go. You know, everything's being prepared. There's a, there's a whole queue going on. So it was a sprint in many ways. So that got us into Dubai. And then Dubai is one of those places you come for one year and you, you stay and you stay and you stay. So I've seen three cycles, three business cycles in Dubai, extreme ups and downs, extreme emotions in people, new people moving in and out. My kids have had new friends about three times. Um, yeah. So, but what's different now in the last four or five years is it's a lot more consistent. It's immigration and there's very little immigration in the last four or five years. Anyway, that got me to Dubai. And then in 2010, 11, after five years of looking and, and looking for investments, I invested in, the, in what we would call e-commerce, but those days was TV commerce. It was a shopping channel, TV shopping channel. So that's when I got into <laughs> investing in, in the tech scene in, in Dubai. I spent five years investing as a solo angel. But then over the next, the last two years of those, so up to 2015, I discovered the people on the cap table, the angels on the cap table were the same angels. So we, I looked at each, we looked at each other and said, why are we doing this individually and spending so much time and effort? Why don't we group together? So we had a dinner together, 10 of us, and said, let's just call ourselves Dubai Angels and, and work together and invest together. Uh, so we said, okay, we'll bring a company each to pitch to us. Uh, in a month's time. Uh, by the time we got to that pitch, we, we didn't only just bring a company each. Each one brought about five friends each. So it ended up being 50, <laughs> 60 people gathering. Uh, and then it grew to about 200 people. So effectively, that was uh, an organic launch of Dubai Angels. So we've invested in about 40 companies along the journey. Am I right in thinking Kush Day was the first angel group in the region when it was launched officially? <laughs> Yeah, the, as, a, as a consortium. So there was a few others. There was uh, Tamar had, had launched, you know, Tamar and Sonia had launched uh, Venture Souk. So those were more deal by deal. Ours was kind of lump sum. What do you think or like, because, you know, you, you've now spent time investing across the globe as well. How, how was those early days different from what you then did later as a global investor? Oh yeah, early days you get you get very emotional, you get very involved, you get attached to the individual investments. And often you, you don't see the, the trees or how do you say the forest through the trees. So I did get involved in individual companies at, at a deep level and get super excited by them. But then later on I realized, well, you know, the market size for these things is this small. The world is this big. So we did shoot a lot of small, uh, big bullets at small, at small uh, elephants. So let's put it away. Yeah. <laughs> put it that way. Important learning, and definitely something that I think that we're seeing in all angel ecosystems. Um, everyone going through that journey. Kush, when you launched Dubai Angels, I remember in the early days I came to a couple of your monthly pitch things at In Five and Tcom, and and it was like you know, 
it, moving to now, there's a lot of angel investments, but back then it was kind of unique, innovative in the region. How easy was it to get more angels into the group or get people to even interested in tech back then and, and, and the evolution of it now? Is it still going? Yeah, we had to close the door because people were bringing their friends. Some of them were not even, you know, they didn't even have the cash. They're like, don't do it. We had to tell people, stop angel investing. Some were pe- bringing their children and the children were putting their pocket money. It was, it was nuts. Uh, so we, the demand was greater than we would, we would recommend. And uh, yeah, everybody no. got, it was those days where everything was booming and it's like the taxi driver wanting to invest. So everybody wanted to be an angel, to be honest. And just be- before we just leave Dubai Angels, I guess, I mean, successes or biggest kind of... Yeah, yeah. Because you, know, you, you had a couple of notable successes. through. We had uh, the very first investment we made was uh, we actually didn't have a structure. So actually, I put all the money until we created a, a legal structure and, and, and invested. So that company uh, went and got, it, effectively, it was an, a voice AI company. In those days, you didn't call it AI. Got uh, taken over by Cisco. And it was a Dubai-based company that moved to, to the valley and then got taken over. We didn't make crazy money. We made two and a half X, but, but it was our first investment and it was a nice exit. We put very little money in it. So in the end, and it wasn't about money, but it was more about the story. And then there is a, a very large one in we invested at very in those days when you in, in, I'm talking 2016 typical valuations were one million 1.2 million dollars so when you put 200k you you're owning a significant stake yeah. in the company so one of those companies which is in Egypt just raised 37 million at 120 and we we still own 10 percent of a company that's now worth 150. 155 million dollars and then uh, Ian, and how uh, how did you how did you come to to join join there so the angels that used to be part of dubai angels were ended up effectively becoming cxos of many of the large companies in in the region so we we focused on ceo type so i had about eight telco ceos as as angels and within e and four four of the angels were e and uh, executives so basically, I got pulled into saying, look, stop doing this small stuff. Let's go big. <laughs> let's, let's do this in a focus with a, with a big engine behind us. So effectively, that's what happened. Yeah. One of the and engines share, pulled us share out. Share with us a bit more. Uh, of course, it's just been in the intro when this goes out. But do, do tell us a bit more about what you're doing at EAD. We used to be called Etisalat, which is the largest telecom operator in the region. We're in 16 different markets with about 160 million customers. Uh, and we're divided into kind of four divisions. There's the telecom division. There's the enterprise, cloud solutions, etc. Division, there is something we call EN Life, which is uh, fintech and entertainment, and then EN Capital. So within EN Capital, we have the VC fund, uh, which is roughly $300 million dollars. And, and we invest in late Series A, early Series B. So it's 10 to $20 million investments. Uh, we intend to make all of those investments by 2025. So we've done eight so far. So call it another 12 to go. But it's global as long as it's either it's disrupting us as a telecom uh, spectrum or we can add value to it. So that's, that's the CVC, the synergy part of the VC part. And we're going to dive much more into your perspectives as a global investor. But before we go there, I just want to ask you to share with us a pivotal moment in your life and describe how it has shaped you as an investor. I love this segment of our podcast. <laughs> this is when it can get emotional or serious yeah. or let's see where we're going to go with this one. Okay. So, you know, probably most people invest because of FOMO, right? So. When I was still in London, before I even started the subway investments, uh, one of my colleagues, his wife joined a startup and all he could talk about when we were working, all he could talk about was, was her, her company. And, and I was like, man, I was getting FOMO on this company. I said, you got to get me in, you got to get me in. So I got into a business <laughs> which made lunchboxes. Now, it made lunchboxes in prison using prison labor. And I was like, wow, you're giving somebody some work to do. And, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and so I put $10,000 into this business. Now, the pivotal moment, moment was 
the guy who, the founder, ran away. <laughs> so he ran away from prison. <laughs> we lost the founder. So, so that was it. That was the end of the project. So the pivotal moment was like, you have to go through everything. You have to understand every aspect of it. Who the people are, how big is the size, you know, where, what are you investing into? What's the legal structure? Don't just get excited and just throw some money at it. So, Has he ever been found? I tried to look for him for about six to nine months, but then I said, okay, you know, that's, <laughs> there are other people more, more, more able to look for him than I. <laughs> so I gave him. <laughs> I think that's that's the first for the podcast. I think we're 200 episodes in, and I think it's the first, it's the first for, for for the podcast. So that's good. Invested in a business supporting prisoners, but the founders run away. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Let me take us into our deep dive section, and this is going to be quite close to to North Star as well, because North Star, of course, is much more than just seeing Dubai, as you guys just said. It's it's about you know, the entry into the Middle East and, and all of Africa, really. So, Kujal, I'd love for us in this interview to really dive into how you think that we as European investors should be thinking about MENA and Africa. And I don't think that there's many that, that will have as, as strong, you know, views and, and, and perspectives as you, because investing out of the end, if our audience doesn't know, that is, as you just heard from the ticket sizes as well, it's quite a beast to be, uh, to be maneuvering and, and, and to be backed by. So great. Um, look, if we take the entire pyramid within MENA, we have a very top-heavy, uh, let's call it the whales. So if we think about the products the, that the high GDP per capita buy, it's, it's extreme. And if you take something like healthcare, the average spend, either that the insurance company or the individual puts on healthcare, is so significant that... Uh, if you have an investment that is focused on, on that high-end space, the margins are huge. The average revenue is huge. Take a, a, as an example, the shopping, average shopping, luxury shopping basket is about 700 US dollars. I think that's about four times the size of, uh, of an average shopping bucket, basket in Europe. So when you're, when you're at $700 uh, and the margins are at 50 60%, you, you, can, you can make money. So there... That's within the GCC, and that's primarily, you know, five, six markets that drive this. And of course, that's a, it's a small customer base, but it's a very high spending customer base. And you'll get a feel for that if you come out to some of the nice restaurants here in North Star. You'll get a feel for the, for the average uh, bill. <laughs> Can we just, uh, because I'm, I'm just going to jump in here because I think some of the listeners, I think I'm not a geography teacher, but let's we'll give a bit of basic geography. So when, when, when we refer to GCC, I think this is really important. So when people think of the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, I, I'd probably break into th two or three, two. I mean, the straightforward one is GCC is the Gulf states. So Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, and Oman. And then you've got the North Africa parts, you've got Egypt, um, Jordan, etc., and then you've got the Levant, Lebanon. Um, so it's, a, and they're all very drastic. But I think overall, four hundred and fifty-five million people. Yeah, correct. predominantly Arabic is the main language, it's different dialects. Um, but that's the way to think about it. You've got the GCC, which everybody knows, and, and I think within the GCC, everybody knows predominantly UAE and Saudi Arabia. But then you've got Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, you've got Iraq, etc. Uh, within that context, and, and, and even so, the markets like Kuwait or or Qatar, the average spend per capita is so significant. You know, it's mm -hmm. even two or three times higher than Saudi Arabia and, and UAE. So, so ex, you know, you do have some very special markets. You have smaller. Smaller but special markets like Iraq, where you have very little competition. Mm -hmm. So if you do bu build out something strong there, the spending power is very high, and and the ability to kind of corner the market is also very high. So that's you know from a GCC perspective, you do have uh, also by the way adjacent to those markets you described, you have the entire French-speaking Africa. You know you go from yeah. Morocco westwards, and you also have touching India, Pakistan. We, you know, India sees Dubai, for example, as just another Indian city. For them, it's a, it's a few hours flight. You can speak any language in India and, 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 and get along here. So for them, it's, it's, just another, it's just another city of India. 
So there are some very large markets next door as well. A fellow podcaster uh, would go and uh, put 150 million or lead 150 million euro round in uh, Pakistan <laughs> and that did not turn out too well. <laughs> um, I'm curious to ask you, this is, this is probably analogous of many and, and obviously because of, uh, of, of, of our fellow podcasters, high le level of uh, attention that's, you know, put on him. Everyone heard about that and saw that and it was in the news, but I'm sure that there's a bunch of European investors that have had similar experiences, just a little less high profile. Could you share us a bit about, uh, you know, if you think as a European investor that you want to do business? In, in GCC and, and, and in MENA in general, what are the pitfalls? How should you think about things? Should you always have a local co-investor with you? How do you think about it? I once went whitewater rafting in the Nile and I went with expert rafters from, uh, from a different river. That We yeah. went to Uganda and we got into the Nile and we, we got some massive rapids, but we didn't know the river. So we took the wrong side of the river and it crushed us. I broke I broke a leg, etc. So, to ask to to answer your question, you never go into the wild without without a guide. Yeah, you you need a guide in the wild, and some of these markets are pretty wild uh, because yeah. they're fairly new. So sometimes governance is not what you would expect ten years from now. Governance is still building up. The ethics are building up. That's part of it. Politics has its own thing uh, in some of these markets. And obviously, currency, whether you're talking about Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, you've got some massive currency devaluations which you have to factor into your equations. Um, all of this is important, and, and there's never a certainty. If you build a relationship with one person, make sure, make sure that's not a political person. <laughs> try, try to keep it economic. <laughs> so, you know, there's no certainty here. But, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think incidents like that, I think what, what it's a bit like VCs who jump on the plane and, you know, hop into Saudi, hop into UAE, expecting to raise money within 24 hours or off one trip. And I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, whether you're investing in this market, whether it be in this region or Pakistan, Bill like Kush says, you know, you've got to be doing it with somebody on the ground in the know. But it's also the other side of it. It's building those relationships, whether you're raising the capital or investing in the side, you've got to really get a deep understanding of the ecosystem and, and spend some time there. It's not, you know, writing a check or trying to raise a check within, within a week. It's, you know, it's going to go bad. It's going to go bad. And that has an impact on these ecosystems, whether it be Pakistan or Egypt or wherever it may be that you, you do these things in. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's similar. Yeah, and, and the good news now both at the VC level, at the LP level, and at the startup level, you do have some very good, strong names. So you have relevant partnerships, relevant people to engage with across the board now. And yeah. But spend time, don't, don't rush into it. Yeah. Would you say, uh, and Omar, this might be more in your direction, because it, it's a long-standing thing that people would it's funny, right? Because at the one hand, everyone would say that, well, if you want to do business in the GCC, then expect it to be very relationship driven. And on the other hand, you have the same person would probably also be the person that would say, you know, or pay pay 3000 euros to jump on a plane and, uh, and, and take a tour and expect to come come back with money. But would you say that that an LP race in MENA is more relationship driven and longer term? than raising from European investors? No, I mean, it, it, it is. And I think if you if you think, I mean, Kush would, would, would probably agree with this. If you go back 10 years to when, you know, when Kush started to buy angels or whatever, and all the, the other things, if you said, you know, to somebody in this region, I want 250,000 to buy a car or a, a property, it's, it's there. But I want to invest in a tech startup or in a fund. It's like, no, you know, you can't see, it, can't feel, it, can't touch. It was that kind of mentality. Fast forward now, the capital is there, but it's still very, you're right, relationship building. It's, you know, it's, you've got to remember that for every individual coming out here pitching a fund, there's another 300 coming out pitching probably the same thing, to be honest. But it's, you know, trying to kind of align 
that value add, align that strategic relationship, that partnership, you know, between the LP and and the fund. You know, there's not a there isn't a the abundance of LPs is not the same as Europe. The maturity is not the same as Europe to a certain degree. So you know, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of relationship building, and it's going to be you know, what can I bring to the table, and as well as what can I offer what can we have in exchange uh, so it's still that mentality um and you know it yeah it takes time but it's it's definitely there and uh, there's a lot it, and it's, it's also getting a lot more maturer now but i think the one thing i would say to any european vc coming here there's hundreds that have come here before you and there's hundreds that will come here after you you know it's the ones it really that you're right it's the ones that build the relationship it's the ones that keep coming back and eventually it's the ones that put feet on the ground and be part of the ecosystem that succeed. There's a term- terminology they use, which is uh, don't be a suitcase salesman. So yeah. come and talk to yourself. So, you know, they, as soon as they see this little briefcase, they feel you're just coming and going. They want to yeah. feel some kind of anchoring going on. That's a, that's a good perspective. And to anyone, to anyone listening and thinking, ha, huh, this is interesting. I'd love to hear more. Expect that we will cover this quite extensively on EU.vc going forward in our newsletters as part of our uh, our trip to North Star. Um, because I personally think that that this is what you're hearing about from everywhere, that the GCC is where there's still money flowing and there's still risk appetite and venture is, uh, is seen as, as very much the route to stardom or <laughs> for the countries, uh, um, new technologies and so on. So for that reason, we, we will be diving much deeper on this. So I want to take us to the biggest learnings uh, from, from the last 10 years of your life. Yeah, so I would say karma, number one, and we'll get dive into it. Always take references, number two, and uh, take the risk, plunge. Those are my three learnings. I want to almost take the take references because I'm sure that's going to get us into the uh, into the, <laughs> the the story the story of our prisoner again. <laughs> but let me hear a bit more. What, why do you think that that this reference check is so important and also link it especially to your your learnings from the region? As part of at least at the angel side, less on the more more structured corporate VC side, but on the angel side because we're emotionally driven on making decisions and it's your own money. Often your emotions say, I really want to bet on this person or this technology or this product. And you kind of ignore bad signals uh, once you're attached to it. So the reference checks is a clarity, gives you clarity. And also often the reference checks are from people you trust, typically. And if they say, give you a negative feedback, take it on board. I've had many incidences where I ignored it. And then, you know, five years later, it turned out. So there is too many opportunities to ignore negative references. Yeah, absolutely. I also think that the part that you spoke about earlier about always having a guide is exactly if you do references as an external person and you're taking references on someone who's actually a person in the ecosystem that there's respect about, but there's also bad things to be said. If you come as a pure outsider, don't expect to be told what's the bad things, right? Because because you're just the outsider. <laughs> so so definitely having that guide is why I personally do LP tickets, right? Because I have no idea and no way to get a good reference check on someone in, say, Romania, if I don't have someone who I can trust there. So I think that that those two connect very well. Then you're saying karma. Um, I'd love to just dive into that one a little bit because it's something that I think is probably understated in VC sometimes. We say that it's relationship driven, but I, I think that diving into karma is probably uh, uh, relevant. In my corporate life, I, I, again, I'm just going to use it, my own illustration. In my corporate life, again, when I used to be in London, I worked with two clients, one I, I hated and one I loved. And, and the one I loved, I did a lot for afterwards. He lost his job. I gave him a lot of support. 14 years later, he turned out to be running a telecom operator in Oman, and he gave me huge opportunities just because he remembered that little bit from 14 years ago. The one I hated turned out to to run a telecom operator in Ethiopia and hates me. <laughs> so he, he would refuse to, to, you know, this goes back a while ago, but it, he would refuse to touch me. Why did I hate him? I, I, I turn back and I say, who was just... Simple, like, okay, he didn't like my, my work. That was all. Uh, yeah. he, he just gave 
just gave feedback. That's ill. But, yeah. you know, I took it personally and all that yeah. karma stuff. So negative and positive energies come back at some point and try to be nice. Try to always yeah. be nice. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a small world. Yeah, it is a very, very small world. Now let's get to the quick fire round and I'm going to run us through this so Kushal can make his meeting in three minutes. So everyone do buckle up. <laughs> and now the quick fire round. First question, what advice would you give your own 10 year younger self? Sleep a lot more. You keep your hair, you you keep your rest. Uh, sleep is important. Sometimes I forget the extra amount of energy you you throw by doing things that are not necessary. I just slept 36 hours almost, so I can absolutely agree with that. That's a record. Yeah. Second question, what are your top tips for emerging VCs who are fundraising? And let's focus that on uh, on the region. Everybody likes a good story, a good narrative. So tell them the full narrative from how you found a, a particular investment, how you scouted it, how you invested, the deal structure, how you supported the founders when things went wrong or good, how you harvested that opportunity, how you exited it, the entire flow. And, and, and bring them into the emotions, bring them through that. Don't just go and tell them, here's my NAV, here's my TPI, here's why I'm great. They, they like the story. They want to drink tea with you and, and have a, you know, read the tea leaves. They don't just want to have a, sell, a sales engagement. So the story brings that engagement much more. And finally, what's the most counterintuitive thing you've learned since you started in venture? Collaborate with your competitors, even with their employees. Again, back to the small world, back to the karma. But more important, our real enemy is the incumbents out there that are not letting the technology guys drive a piercing through them, especially in things like fintech, etc. Can I just add just quickly to, to Kusha? I was going to say the first one is don't give a shit. Um, really, just don't give a shit about it. Just get on with it. The second one for emerging VC is nobody cares about your MBA or what you did to business school. I think that's nobody cares. I think I'll leave it at those two. I just really want to get those two in. <laughs> so I actually think that we should do a full to anyone hearing uh, you talking earlier today, Omar, about how to think about racing from the region and so on. I think that we need to do a deep dive entirely on that because I think that that's, that's where many people's mind is these days. Both of you, thanks so much for joining us. You've been amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Tear down this wall. It's more than just an alliance. An alliance. This, this is a union of values, of values. United and determined, we can serve as a model for other regions of the world. The nature of a problem, problem requires a European response. Europe is a story of new beginnings, new, new beginnings. Let's start acting, acting, acting.